I know what you are. See it. Skinny queen. This all started when I posted a Twilight-inspired outfits TikTok and received a comment that read, and I quote, I don't think vampires are into fatties, which prompted me to create a second video where I style what I would wear as a vampire, which got me thinking, why are there barely any fat vampires? Yes, there's Shaban in Twilight. There's half of Guillermo in what we do in the Shadows TV series because he's technically not a full vampire, but I'm still counting it. Eddie from True Blood. I did find a couple of book series about fat vampires aptly called Fat Vampire and Fat Vampire. One of the books was adapted into a show called Reginald the Vampire, which I haven't watched, but might be promising. And yes, there's also Pearl the Fat Vampire from Blade. But why not more? Before we begin, I do just want to give a quick disclaimer that I obviously have not seen every piece of vampire media in existence, so it's possible I might have missed a minor character somewhere, but everything in this video still stands regardless. I do also just want to give a content warning for discussions of eating disorders, anorexia, and fat phobia. If you're like me and you scour Reddit for the answers to everything, here are some interesting responses I found. I think the fat gets burned off during the turning process or turned into muscle. Vampires are supposed to be physically perfect and excessive fat isn't necessary, for lack of a better word, to the body. I always understood that vampirism makes your body into the most fit slash healthy version of itself, but that could be wrong. There's also the factor that there's been a spike in average weight in the modern era. It would be incredibly rare to find a thousand year old plus size vampire because a thousand years ago nutrition and growth patterns were very different and were often restricted to the aristocracy, who were likely more protected from vampire attacks and transformations than, say, a starving serf who could be stolen and transformed. And there's just a lot more comments of people saying that they assumed the fat just melts off their body during the transformation process, which I get, but why? Vampires are presumably mythical creatures, and as much as we want to rationalize and theorize in order for it to make sense to our brains, they are fake, made up. So why no fat vampire? In order for us to understand why there are barely any fat vampires in media, I think it's important to understand one of the most impactful and popular pieces of vampire media in modern history, Twilight. It's Twilight. For the sake of this video, I am going to mostly reference the Twilight Saga. I know I'm leaving out other vampire shows like The Vampire Diaries, but I haven't watched that show since I was 13, so I wouldn't really be a reliable narrator. There's also Buffy and True Blood, which I will briefly mention, but for the sake of my own sanity, I need to keep this video concise and concentrated. I'm gonna give a brief, and I emphasize brief, history of vampires because this is not a history video. This is a just hyperfixation video. The history of vampires is very long and very complex since cultures from all over the world and practically every period of time have their own legends and folklore around the undead. According to Liza Bundesen, I'm very sorry if I'm mispronouncing that Liza, it is difficult to pinpoint the exact origin of the vampire legend. The vampire was probably born in the 13th or 14th centuries, but detailed written accounts did not appear until hundreds of years later. Records of vampire encounters are found in every culture. The best accounts are European specifically from the Slavic countries during the 18th century. The original Slavic vampire bears no resemblance to the genteel vampire of fiction. The Slavic vampire also was referred to as a revenant, a supernatural being who returns from the dead. In folklore, the revenants are people who died before their time and have returned to bring death to their friends and neighbors. Interest in the vampire exploded in Europe during the early 1700s. The Treaty of Pesarovic of 1718 was one cause of the commotion. The treaty provided that parts of Serbia and Wallachia be given to Austria. Austria. The Austrian forces occupied these regions until 1739 and filed reports on a bizarre local practice, exhuming bodies and killing them. The first supposed vampire had been a man named Arnold Powell, 
who had died years before the investigation. The villagers felt that they had clear proof that Powell was the undead. They exhumed his corpse and found him to be undecayed with fresh blood flowing from his eyes, nose, mouth, and ears. They said that the nails on his hands and feet had fallen off and new nails had grown. His old skin appeared to have been replaced by fresh new skin. From these observations, the villagers concluded that Powell was a true vampire. When they drove a stake through his heart, it was said that he gave an audible groan and bled tremendously likely thing to happen when you stab someone. Liza goes on to give similar examples of stories that have been recorded throughout history, but rationalizes these stories through people's fear of the unknown. The theory of vampirism probably originated from frightened people's attempts to explain that which they could not understand. Our ancestors did not fully comprehend the nature of disease. If a contagion was introduced into a village, it often wiped out whole groups of people. The people must have been paralyzed by terror. They thought that death was contagious, not virus and bacteria. Their misunderstanding of the decomposition process led them to the conclusion that ruddy-colored bloated corpses hunted them. They learned to fear their dreams. They learned to perform rituals that would terminate their hunters. As time passed, our ancestors developed elaborate stories about vampires. All the while, their terror mounted, for the European peasants feared one thing more than death. They feared losing their chance of salvation. If they were killed by a vampire, then they too would be damned. The thought of being unable to rest for eternity instilled horror in European peasants, making the curse of vampirism more feared than any physical illness. I'm sure every culture has their own origins and explanations of what vampires are, and this is just one part of vampire folklore and history. And now a quick break from vampires, so we can talk about the important stuff in life. Underwear. As a plus size person with small boobs, I'm someone who usually never wears a bra because it feels really impossible to find one that fits me yet alone is comfortable and cute, which is why I'm always happy to reintroduce today's sponsor, Parade. Duh, of course I have a really good discount code for you guys, so keep listening if you're interested. If you're not familiar with Parade by now, you should be. Like, seriously, where have you been? If not, here's a quick recap. <laughs> They're an inclusive female-owned brand that makes sustainable and affordable bras, bralettes, swimsuits, underwear, you name it. I really prefer my underwear to be cotton and words cannot express to you how much I love all of my cotton underwear from Parade. They're just really soft and always make me forget that I'm even wearing underwear, which is always the gold for me. This set is from their new cotton collection and I'm wearing the ultra flattering high rise thong and dream fit triangle bralette in eight ball. I'd show you the back, but I don't want to be banned from YouTube forever. I also usually despise thongs, but it's wild how much your thong wearing experience improves when you're wearing a cotton one. I'm not usually one to get giddy, but look how cute this bralette is. This print is so cool. It makes me feel like it's summertime and I'm lying by the lake and the water's glistening and the tall trees are enveloping me. Yes, I'm manifesting because I'm not excited for winter. This top is from Parade's Universal Seamless Collection and it's the Smooth Lift Triangle Bralette in Toile. This is the last set in my Parade order and I love this little keyhole cutout. It just adds a certain je ne sais quoi. Like I think wearing this bralette as a top with some sweatpants around your apartment would be such a comfy girl sleigh. I'm wearing the peekaboo scoop bralette and vintage high cut brief in lust. You can use jb-bf to get 50% off your parade order. No, you didn't mishear me. I said 50% off. Again, my code is jb-bf and parades Black Friday Cyber Monday sale ends on November 29th. As always, have fun, get your steal, and grab something cute and cozy for yourself so you can feel hot even during winter without breaking the bank of course and thank you to parade for sponsoring today's video i'm sure we're all familiar with how vampires no matter what time period the media or characters take place in usually always have a connection to the georgian or victorian eras which was about 1714 to 1830 and 1837 to 1901. But why is that? The charismatic and sophisticated vampire of modern fiction was born in 1819 with the publication of The Vampire by John Polidori. However, it is Bram Stoker's 1897 novel, Dracula, which is remembered as the quintessential vampire novel and provided the basis of the modern vampire legend. The success of this book spawned a distinctive vampire genre, still popular in the 21st century with books, films, and television shows. The vampire has since become a dominant figure in the horror genre. 
The Oxford English Dictionary dates the first appearance of the English word vampire from 1734 in a travelogue titled Travels of Three English Gentlemen, published in the Harleian Miscellany in 1745. An even earlier example is found in the retelling of the famous case of Arno Pal and Pedar Blagojevich in Serbia, where the London Journal of March 11, 1732, describes vampires in Hungary as sucking the blood of the living. After Austria gained control of northern Serbia in Altenia with the Treaty of Paserovic in 17. 1818, officials note the local practice of exhuming bodies and killing vampires. These reports, prepared between 1725 and 1732, received widespread publicity. Fun fact, but there was a contest between John Polidori, Mary Shelley, Lord Byron, and Percy Shelley, and this contest produced The Vampire, but it also brought about Frankenstein by Mary Shelley. I read an article called Sins of the Flesh, Anorexia, Eroticism, and the Female Vampire in Bram Stoker's Dracula by Emma dominguez Rue, which I think is really fascinating and important to set the backdrop of the rise in Western vampire media. Can you tell I have a sociology degree? The 19th century, and certainly the 20th as well, viewed anorexia as a clearly gendered disease, like other so-called female maladies. It was connected with male standards of femininity that regarded women as angels of purity and innocence, and thus as physically weaker and necessarily less carnal than men. Middle and upper class women who displayed symptoms of emaciation showed their decorative status, and their husband's wealth in being able to afford such an unproductive wife, and clearly exhibited their opposition to the typical large and fleshy working-class woman. As a result, the notion that a true lady had to be petite and fragile in order to emphasize her angelic, bodiless, and passionless nature encouraged delicacy and an unnatural weakness in women. Control of food intake was obviously crucial in achieving this appearance of sickly loveliness, so fasting and vomiting became an effective instrument for young women of the period who wished, or rather imperiously needed, to appear attractive to the male gaze. I think this history is important to the discussion of vampires, especially since so much vampire media either takes place during or alludes to the Victorian era. Some theories for this include outbreaks of tuberculosis during this time, the rise in immigration of Eastern European immigrants, mostly Jewish people, which not so fun fact. Jews used to be accused of blood libel by preying on Christian children and drinking their blood, which obviously wasn't true. I'm, I'm Jewish. I'm not endorsing that. I'm just merely telling you all. Don't mind me just waiting for all the noisy traffic to pass by. And because this was a time where gothic literature was becoming more popular as a genre, like Bram Stoker's Dracula in 1897 and Robert Louis Stevenson's Strange Case of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde in 1886. Moving on, Emma goes on to analyze Bram Stoker's Dracula and makes the point that vampire literature often associates eating as a negative, monstrous act. Women's hunger in particular, with its symbolic association with lust, aggression, and lack of self-control, finds its apogee in vampirism, which exaggerates cultural anxieties about consumption in the figure of the bloodthirsty vampire. Women's hunger and appetite is something that's strictly judged. If you eat what you want and don't count calories, you're unladylike, gluttonous, and need to learn self-control. If you don't eat enough, then there's something inside of you that's broken and needs fixing. If you're too fat, put down the cheeseburgers. If you're too thin, pick up a cheeseburger. It's all pretty mindless and horrible. Women are often conditioned to feel an immense amount of shame and guilt surrounding food, which is often pushed onto us since we're small children by the adults around us and the media we consume. Isn't existing fun? Although women were idealized as angelic beings, they were simultaneously feared as sexually voracious monsters. Both mythology and ideology in Western culture have identified images of femininity as devouring, insatiable, hungering, voracious, without restraint, always wanting, the true woman was thus expected to regulate her behavior and her appetite as a symbol of self-control over her potentially dangerous nature. Victorian culture associated body fat with an unrestrained sexual appetite. Female hunger, as a side of transgressive desires, is fearful in and of itself. Women's bodies reflect their sexual propensities. So basically, towards the end of the Victorian era, if you were curvy or voluptuous or, dare I say, fat, you were assumed to have an overactive sex drive, amongst other things. 
So women turned to eating disorders to avoid this. Because above all else, women were supposed to be feminine and dainty. Quick side note, but obviously this is different from culture to culture. This article is mostly talking about white British Victorian women. So obviously like the scope is very limited, but I'm sure there's different stories and beauty standards for different cultures throughout this period of time. The beauty standard went from associating roundness with health and beauty to viewing fatness as a sign that a woman was inconsiderate, stupid, lazy, promiscuous, or insane. In fact, famed criminologist, phrenologist, and eugenicist, oh, <laughs> okay, Cesar Lombroso wrote in his 1897 book, The Female Offender, that he believed there was a connection between weight and prostitution. This greater weight among prostitutes is confirmed by the notorious fact of the obesity of those who grow old in their vile trade and who gradually become positive monsters of adipose tissue. Did, did you think that was all? <laughs> Don't be silly. He even looked at the weights and measurements of women who had been committed to insane asylums saying, in conclusion, I would remark that in prisons and asylums for the insane, the female lunatics are far more often exaggeratedly fat than the men. That's all to say, the culture of the time was very much fat phobic and went so far as to suggest that a person's body weight was also indicative of their sexuality and intelligence. So, you know, good old phrenology but of the body. Just to really solidify how similar the ideology towards fat people was during the Victorian era and now, here's an excerpt from the 1899 book, The Woman Beautiful. Wherever the fat woman finds herself in a crowd and where can she avoid it in the metropolis, she is in effect an intruder, for she occupies twice the space to which she is entitled and inflicts upon her companions through every one of her excessive pounds just so much additional fatigue and discomfort. Too often, this so redundant flesh seems to serve as a bulletproof armor, repelling all consciousness of the rights of others. The woman who makes a god of her stomach is incorrigible, and I fear no word of mine will avail to induce her to reform. She is the innately selfish woman who makes her very existence an offense. This paragraph reminds me a lot of the discourse around airplane seats and the manufactured outrage about fat people demanding bigger seats and more space on planes when it's like more space would benefit everyone. And by manufactured outrage, I mean that random tabloid websites and Twitter users will fake videos of content they've stolen from fat creators or words they've said and manipulate them to make it seem like the creator is outright demanding wider seats. I won't get into it too much, but getting mad at consumers for wanting more space on commercial airplanes that you spend hours and hundreds of dollars on just to be packed together and uncomfortable for hours on end is pretty ridiculous. More space and comfort on airplanes would benefit us all. So to recap, being fat, according to these Victorian writers, makes you stupid, lazy, overly sexual, insane, and selfish. Am I good at screaming? Um, I think I am good at screaming. I can scream for you. Let me, let me hear you. While I personally don't find any of this information particularly surprising or shocking, because this isn't my first time researching fat phobia and also I exist on the internet, it is really disheartening to realize that a lot of people's opinions about fat people haven't really changed in centuries. Like yes, we're very very slowly making progress, but it sucks nonetheless. On to something, how do you say, not much greater. In the late 1980s and mid 2010s, there was a shift between the vampires of Dracula and Nosferatu as being inhuman, scary, undead monsters to the hot, mysterious, rebellious, and cool vampires, a la Spike from Buffy the Vampire Slayer, the Lost Boys, the Salvatore Brothers, and Edward Cullen. There was this emphasis on anti-heroes and having a character that was deeply flawed, lacked traditional morality, and still did bad things, but were overall just a dark and tortured person that at the end of the day 
still had some good in them. And this shift is significant because vampires went from being a scary creature to a sexy fantasy, which requires a certain level of desirability to maintain. I found this really interesting academic article called Good Vampires Don't Eat, Anorexic Logic in Stephanie Meyer's Twilight Series by Emma Dunn. And Emma was actually kind enough to actually respond to my email when I couldn't access this article without spending $50. So thank you, Emma. As written by Dunn, Vampires function as hyperbolic manifestations of the cultural values and anxieties of their specific generation. Because vampire mythology always hinges on the act of feeding, with the vampire's mouth acting as the paramount site of eroticism, it is a particularly rich arena for exploring cultural fears about consumption. Although anorexic values date back to Cartesian dualism, anorexia itself was not diagnosed until the late 19th century, when changes in fashion, medicine, and gender norms reflected and reified an increased cultural valorization of female thinness, purity, self-discipline, and asceticism. In accordance with the anorexic feminine ideal of the period, the evil Lucy feasts in Stoker's novel while the good Lucy, at least usually, does not. Dunn basically argues that vampires in modern media, although she is focusing on Twilight specifically, operate under a anorexic ideology. Anorexic ideology thus lies within the challenging sets of contradictions with which post-feminism confronts women, that they must restrict food but also consume products, embody the masculine mind but also the feminine body, and make autonomous choices but also the correct choices, like the post-feminist superwoman who gains subjectivity by embodying aspects of ideal masculinity and femininity simultaneously, the individual with anorexia feels she can only be someone if she is not herself. That is, she can only be someone if she identifies with the masculine while simultaneously maintaining the appearance of the feminine. Like the quintessential post-feminist subject, she employs what she perceives as mental strength to escape the body's materiality, including its age, shape, and gender. In other words, she strives to occupy what is typically coded as the masculine space of will, but in a way that is perceived as fundamentally feminine. Thus, although a post-feminist vision of ideal ideal femininity may appear discreet from the romanticized and valid aesthetic that epitomize the Victorian anorexic paradigm, post-feminist discourses of empowerment and choice are merely a guise concealing the propagation of deep-rooted gender norms valorizing female asceticism and body discipline. I've never read the Twilight books, I've only watched the movies, but Dunn goes on to explain that although Bella refers to herself as slender in the book, simply being slender isn't enough. Bella emphasizes that although she's thin, she's always been soft somehow, obviously not an athlete, and how this softness and therefore fragility is portrayed in direct opposition to the hardness and external perfection of the vampire body. And how there's multiple instances throughout the book where Bella doesn't eat or refuses to eat with her general attitude toward food kind of being unconcerned and apathetic which allows her to have a sense of control while remaining within the confines of acceptable feminine behavior. But once Bella is transformed into a vampire, not only does Bella's mind gain total control over her body's physical abilities, it also dominates those bodily appetites that restrict and burden her as a human, including her sexual appetite. Although Bella's body is sexier as a vampire and the protagonist with increased control over her body and sexual appetite, Bella also gains powers over her appetite for food as a vampire. The protagonist becomes the ultimate restrictor figure as her ability to resist consumption increases along with her desire to consume. From the start of the Twilight series, vampire eating is presented as hypersensual and hyper pleasurable. Explaining the vampire hunting experience, Edward tells Bella, we give ourselves over to our senses and govern less with our minds. Although Meyer's novels portray vampire feeding as euphoric and uncontrollable, they simultaneously condemn the satiation of that very hunger. Like persons with anorexia, which often experience the battle between will and appetite as one between good and evil, in the Twilight series, good vampires, the Cullens, restrict their appetites while villainous vampires, James and Victoria, indulge. In fact, the Cullen family is rarely shown eating at all. From their first moments in the series, the Cullens are characterized as angelic figures marked by their ability to transcend the body's needs and appetites, garnering Bella's attention and admiration. When Bella becomes a vampire herself and legitimizes her place in the Cullen family, she too becomes a virtuous restrictor. I know some of you may think this analysis went a little too far and that the Cullens are the good vampires because they don't eat people and the villainous vampires are evil because they do eat people. But I think this perspective is interesting because every story in folklore is rooted in real life 
and human experience, right? Even though vampires aren't real, there's human reasoning and experience behind it. Once again, I haven't read the books, but I'm sure a lot of you watching have. So if you have like your opinions on like Bella's portrayal throughout the book and what this author is saying, I'd love to hear it as long as we keep everything like respectful and not vicious. To understand why vampires are almost always portrayed as thin, white, and conventionally attractive, I think it's important to analyze the vampire media you're consuming through the lens of the people and society in which it was written. And it's no secret that in the United States, which is the country I'm speaking for because this is the only country I have ever lived in, what's typically celebrated is white, heterosexual, thin, able-bodied, conventionally attractive people. Vampirism in media is all about hunger, but as long as you're thin and beautiful. And I know, all right, I know about Chabon. I know about her. And in fact, here's an interesting clip from a TikTok I found that I will also link down below. Let's talk about Siobhan, the Twilight vampire that Stephanie Meyer repeatedly refers to as voluptuous. In the illustrated guide, uh, Stephanie notes that Siobhan is 6'2". Stephanie says that she's very tall, muscular, and voluptuous, and extraordinarily beautiful in her facial features. Siobhan is born in 1490 in Ireland. She's the only daughter of a blacksmith and his wife, which is rare because most families in Ireland at the time had a lot of kids. By the time she's 14, she's taller than all the women in the village. By the time she's 16, she's taller than all the men as well. She's also stronger than all the men, and when her dad dies when she's 17, she takes over his craft, which everyone's like, ooh, a female blacksmith. She became famous in the surrounding areas as the big blacksmith girl. Despite her beautiful face and generous hourglass figure, Stephanie's words, she could not attract any suitors. I wonder why. Everyone was intimidated by her height and strength, and Siobhan's like, good, I don't need a husband. I'm great. For those of you who don't know, in Twilight, Siobhan is the leader of the Irish coven, and although she's mentioned in the Twilight books, she's only ever shown in the movie movies in Breaking Dawn Part 2. I do just want to note how her body is described in Midnight Sun because it is fucking insane. She was the largest woman I had ever seen, taller than either Carlisle or me, with broader shoulders and thicker limbs. However, there was nothing masculine about her. She was profoundly female in shape, aggressively, forcefully female. It had been in another lifetime that I had last noticed a woman this way, and I found I was hard pressed to know where to put my eyes. I centered them on her face, which, like her body, was intensely female. Her lips were full and curved, her deep crimson eyes enormous and fringed by lashes thicker than the needles on the pine boughs. Her glossy black hair was piled into a generous roll on top of her head. And here's how she's described in Breaking Dawn. Shaban, a woman of immense presence whose huge body was both beautiful and mesmerizing as it moved in smooth undulations. Smooth undulations. Are you sure? Are you sure smooth undulations is the phrase you want to go with? So although the movie adaptation of Shaban portrays her as more curvy, the book description of Shaban is just kind of weird and funny. Like, just say you think she's hot. Why do you have to be weird about it? And by weird, I mean there's such an emphasis on her being aggressively, forcefully female. Even though Siobhan has more masculine traits like her height and build, there's nothing masculine about her. Besides calling her tall with broad shoulders and thicker limbs, the only way Edward describes her is intensely female. I'm assuming intensely female means she has an hourglass figure with big boobs and a big butt, which isn't surprising because that's what most plus size representation is. Shaban is a really cool character. Don't get me wrong. Like I am not anti Shaban whatsoever, but what I am anti is just the lack of good plus size representation in general, but especially plus size vampires, because in the book, she's not even described as plus size. And in the movie, they do make her more curvy, but it's not enough. Maybe I would be a good vampire because I'm insatiable. When I set off on researching this video, I was looking for answers. And boy, did I find them. I'm not shocked or surprised by my findings, but I am disappointed. Surprised, but I knew the answer all along. It's fat phobia and probably racism because fat phobia is rooted in racism and also vampires are almost always white. 
editor Jess here because I realized I was missing a key piece of twisted Twilight slash Stephanie Meyer lore, which is this quote that's from the Twilight Illustrated Guide, I believe. Pale vampire skin is a product of vampire venom's transformative process. The venom leeches all pigment from the skin as it changes the human skin into the more indestructible vampire form. Regardless of original ethnicity, a vampire's skin will be exceptionally pale. The hue varies slightly, with darker-skinned humans having a barely discernible olive tone to their vampire skin, but the light shade remains the same. I don't know a lot about Stephanie Meyer, but a lot of people did point out that she is Mormon, and allegedly, she was very upset when a black actor was cast in Twilight, so take with that what you will. Um, it's all pretty gross. But I didn't go $30,000 in debt for my sociology degree for nothing. I'm a simple 25 year old teenage girl and I just want to see vampires that look like me and my friends. And I do just want to say that I kind of hate the theory that during the vampire transformation process that gets burned off and is turned into muscle because vampires have to be physically perfect. Never have I seen a vampire movie where a fat person gets turned and then suddenly they're skinny. Like, it might exist, but I have never seen it. Also, I'm not even in the mood to unpack what physical perfection means, but why does it matter? Because vampires are predators? They are made up. They could quite literally be whatever we want them to be. It's also Eddie Fournier and Guillermo de la Cruz erasure. At the end of the day, I know the answer to my own question. I know it's mostly because of desirability and biases and beauty standards that pervade a lot of the world. And I would say that I don't know why I care so much about this subject, but I do. I really think a fat vampire would be sexy. Like, I'm sorry if you were searching for a deeper motive, but I just think fat vampires would be cool and sexy and fun. Which is why I have something to reveal to you all. These are definitely real. Um, don't look too close at them, but they're totally real. I know a lot of people will think this video is dumb and say stuff like, who cares? And there's more important issues in the world. And yeah, there are a lot of really important issues in the world and fat phobia is one of them, as well as lack of meaningful representation. I'm sure a lot of people know how much it sucks to never see people who look like you in media, and as most of us know, representation is important. I'm trying to be so serious, but seeing myself and feeling these fangs in my mouth while I do it, it's just creating an unserious environment. With representation, it comes more visibility and humanization. Groups of people that you might be unfamiliar with become less stigmatized and stereotyped with good representation at least. Like Pearl from Blade is obviously bad representation because it dehumanizes fat people and turns somebody's body and existence into cruel entertainment. Like, <laughs> look how big and disgusting this vampire is. Isn't it funny? But Guillermo from the What We Do in the Shadows TV show is a plus size gay Mexican American character whose weight is never mentioned or negatively talked about. Granted, he is kind of more half vampire, but he did get bit and turned, so I'm still counting it. I can't believe I still have these freaking fangs in. I'm not saying that having a cool fat vampire is gonna solve every social issue in the world, but rather that it'd just be cool. Thank you for watching this video and sticking with me through my big reveal. I'd love to hear your thoughts in the comments below as long as everything remains respectful and distinguished respectful and distinguished. Yes, I had to repeat that for emphasis. If you like this video, you know what to do. Thumbs up, subscribe, whatever floats your boat, and I'll see you in my next video. Bye.